Okay, we're going to call the school board regular December board meeting to order at 7.25. Can we have a roll call? I think that's going to be you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Brad. Board, board secretary. Yeah.
Um, well, if you're finding that for a period of time, we actually have a significant amount of community quarantine that far exceed what's happening in our building. So, for example, in time, my building had 89 students on quarantine, but about 25 of those were because of people in the community. So, mom or dad that was positive, and the kids had to stay home, um, and, and so forth with that. So, we updated that dashboard so that people could clearly see. You know, how many people are out related to COVID and is it related to something in our building or external to our building? Those uh, dashboards are operated by state commissioner um, generally in real time. So as soon as we have officially cleared or put people on quarantine, she's notified and then that those numbers are updated as soon as practical. So that's a tool available to parents to kind of community members to know where our district is sitting at um, because we are a smaller district. Any numbers less than five for two positive. Is represented as an asterisk, and that's explained on the website um, because if you have staff and students delineated, it's a pretty small district. You can figure it out um, pretty quickly. So, to privacy, we do use that as an asterisk for our communication. Um, in general, when we're talking about how the new the guidelines, the updated dashboards, and that teacher workload sort of comes together with COVID, um, teacher wise, every time we send um, students in or out, that places a teacher to teach duly in person and virtually for now it's going to be 10 days at a minimum, sometimes up to 24, depending on the situation that's going on. And I would estimate that each space um, of COVID is probably putting teachers at about an additional eight to 10 hours of work per case to be able to practice and send things home um, and respond appropriately to families and needs and questions. Yeah, I mean, my book of perspective where I try to get six, seven, eight, nine emails from in a day that goes a lot for three days, goes a lot for 10 days, goes a lot for a dozen year old. Um, and they dealt with it really well, but it, it's a lot of in and out and in and out and in and out. So it's definitely increased people working on the board shift. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah. Um, so we move to the scenario tonight. One thing that we kind of wanted to just kind of point out is that we get a lot of questions of why we do things differently in each case, and it truly does depend on the very specifics of every case. So we wanted to kind of give you an idea of what our process is and what it looks like between the three of us when we do have a positive case, whether that be a community member, parent, etc., a student in our building, or teacher within our building. Because it looks a little bit different depending on timeline and who is the positive case. So we just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what that looks like and what those procedures look like. So our first scenario would be Zach's mom calls school on Wednesday to indicate that dad is tested positive for COVID. Zach is not at school on Wednesday, but was in school on Monday or Tuesday. Mom wants to know how long Zach has to quarantine. Mom and Zach are showing mild symptoms and are going to get tested, and mom will follow up with results. So Carrie's going to walk us through what our process and steps would be. So the first thing we end up doing is talking about the day or the person that's positive. Because in order to establish any return for anyone in the home, I have to know when the dad can end quarantine. So a month and a half ago, I would say, when's your quarantine over? And they say, oh, the health department just called my quarantine over the seven weeks. And I say, now they say, I have no idea because I talked to them. So now we talk about when did your symptoms start? And I say, well, this is what I would establish as your quarantine. You should confirm with the health department. And then we start talking about the case. So if we're dealing with an elementary school kid for the most part, and this is one of the parts where parents really get hung up, you cannot start your close contact quarantine until the positive person is off quarantine. And the way I explain it is this. We live in the same house. Every time I see her, she can infect me in there and starts my 14 days. So if I see her on Monday, I go 14 days to see her on Tuesday, I go 14 days to Wednesday. So with an elementary kid, huh? Now now time, time. Now time. Sorry. I'm so used to working. Now time. Now time. Um, it, it's difficult with an elementary kid, those of you who you all have had kids. There's no way you're getting your seven-year-old to leave your home for 10 days for these kids to perform. So they can't start until you're done. So that means, in theory, a 20-day quarantine for a close contact. Now, never do we know prior to the person being sick. You know, we're going back a couple days. But on average, I would say when it was 14, they were probably out of school 18 to 20 days. Um, so, I mean, you're talking a long time. I did this a whole month back forward, never, never came to school. The other part of it is that a high school kid, and I call it, say, Ken Tyson. So I've had some high school kids that say, I got my own bathroom, or my mom's living in the basement, and I'm never going to see her, which will work. But then they can quarantine 10 days from the last time they were in contact with a positive person. 
So that's the role that, that I tell them all that. You still have to really monitor the symptoms. You think you're not in contact, but you really have to be careful with them. So that, that time frame is what determines that close contact, how long, long they're out. So say that went to a family party on Saturday, found out Sunday somebody positive. He only has to trace back to the last time he saw that positive person. If they live in their house, again, that's where that conversation comes from, and that's really a lot of what we've been dealing with. Somebody in the home is positive, and that's what they need to do. Um, the minute we can find out somebody positive, I send an email out, say you communicate out, and basically we start them virtual the next day. I think the teachers a little bit of time to, to get caught up, but then we get them on. And they attend virtually, and they do everything they can virtually between between now and then. Um, I'm getting on my point. Yeah, like I said, we really are, and we always. I don't know. The other thing we do is then they get an email with a close contact letter. It, the date is in there, and then mine also get instructions on how to what it means to be a virtual kit. So all of that comes home to them as well. So then, so that's it. So then we kind of add a little about the patient and go to the scenario too, if then mom calls Thursday afternoon to tell dad, dad has the positive. So now we have a little bit more conversation because kind of going back to the seven degrees of bacon, you know, we don't contact trace past the rest of the the positive, but now we have a positive child, and it, it incorporates a lot more of this into the So anytime anyone tells positive, we have to trace that 48 hours from onset of symptoms. So now we use our scenario. So that was say on Wednesday when mom called in, and he was in the building Monday and Tuesday, which gets you back to 48 hours. So we have to look at school on Monday and Tuesday, who he was around, who he was in close contact to, who he was around and in touch with. Keeping in mind that close contact is within six feet for 15 minutes or more within 24 hours. So you got to kind of force together. Now, no longer one 15 minute incident. We got close. Yeah, that's where we're at. We were close. So it's no longer one 15 minute incident. It's 15 minutes over 24 hours. So that, that was a change of that incident. That also has thrown up some wrenches into it. So we begin that contact tracing and we go back. Now there's a big difference at the high school and middle school. I know that for elementary school. And I know that some of the class that has been open. But imagine again you are a six-year-old in a classroom for we what did we say? An average of six hours over two days with a positive person. I don't know, given an environment of an elementary school and lunch and recess and all of that. What level of comfort we can have saying that you didn't have more than 15 minutes of contact with that person. That's what typically has been leading to at an elementary school with a positive teacher, a positive junior, a positive staff member, that the entire class has been going home. And I know that's been stressful and frustrating, but I do believe, and actually we know based on our most recent scenario, it has prevented further spread in the building or the possibility of further spread in the building. Up here, we might just move up in 45 minutes. The, the classes are, are phased differently, everything is different. So we literally go in and we get a seating chart. And we draw a circle and we say, who were they around? We look at the camera, we look at side eyes, we look at lunch, we look at hallways, and we try and figure out who were they were around and for how long. We have conversations with the teachers. Did you do group work that day? Who did they work with? How long were they for? Again, we're asking the teachers to remember a lot. Just keep in mind, this is now Thursday, and I'm asking you to remember everything about Monday. So that, that time frame, it gets, it gets stressful. So and if it's borderline, we make a decision and determine that on both times. And we have some really tricky scenarios lately of where the kids do have to go back for 48 hours, where they have last contact on a Friday. And so we're calling people on a Tuesday when we get that positive answer and have to go back to that Friday. And people don't quite understand like what happened in the last 24 hours, but it's that last 48 hours that they were in contact. We're looking at symptoms and who they were around. So we're watching cameras a lot, we're watching kids, we're trying to track them, who they're around, we're watching timelines to make sure that we're adding up and how much time we're together with different kids. Yeah, sorry, just lost it. my kids. No. Uh, so then would that that those students quarantine start from the date of positive, or would that No, start it starts from the last time you were around the person who was positive. So in our scenario, we would start Tuesday, would be their day zero, 
Wednesday and Thursday one, and we go ten days from this. So direct contact with positive persons. The only Wait, forty-eight hours of onset of that positive yeah. person's symptoms. The only thing that goes on a test is if you're asymptomatic. So if you're asymptomatic and have no idea when the symptoms started, your quarantine is always static and tested. So that's the only kind of test they did use at this point. Um, so we said on staff that was those contacts, like in Katie's world, she looked at special, she looked at recess, she looked at all of that. And then again, we're doing virtual instruction during that time. So those two kind of links together to give you an idea of, of how things kind of can shift from, well, we think we have this under control and we went home to, okay, now we've got problems. So scenario three is complicated, but it's what, what it seems to be happening about 90% of the time and causes some hiccups. Yeah, yeah, scenario three is the elementary is something that is causing us stress across the board um, and really creating some situations that could be prevented and that we're really trying to hammer home to people. Well. You well, um, so, some people have had really well on Monday and it's like uh, a terrible one except in school. Anyway, no, no, to be honest, it's time. To be safe, you're going to school and nothing goes on top. Tuesday night, she developed a fever and mom came from Wednesday before we get tested. She gets her results on Thursday and starts positive. So this is a scenario that we're having a lot where things are coming where it's really minor symptoms and we don't think much of it because we never have in the past. So then what ends up happening uh, is the quarantine based on the, the previous computer we talked about, all the exact same protocols, but now we find out that, um, you know, he looks positive. We end up having to send home an entire class full of 25 students for 10 days. And sometimes more than that, depending on where the student is. So if Mila has not come to school on Monday, um, even she was symptomatic, then no students and staff would have had enough quarantine at all. But she had just called and said, hey, Mila doesn't feel good. So the thing that I've been putting a lot of my weekly messages lately is three days home saves everybody, everybody time. Um, where you can just hang out for three days, you're going to and see if it's going to pan out. You may save the entire class from going home on an entire quarantine. Um, you know, along the way. So that's kind of what we're coming up where kids are getting fed sick and simply in talking and uh, all those things that are typically elementary that ordinarily we wouldn't keep them home for, but the impact of not keeping them home this time um, is, is pretty significant. I think especially if, and I don't judge anybody's choices, but there were several districts that have families voluntarily quarantine, like after Thanksgiving, right? So they sit back that week, some of the next week. So kind of knowing where what choices you made that had potential exposure and combining that with the symptoms, you know, I think that for the most part, people have been accepting to the three days out policy and we follow that really diligently, but it would be better if they enacted it and kept them home than us sending them home. Because by the time we sent them home, they right. probably are past our, our exposure point. And then this is also the only scenario that directly affects siblings. So because Mila will be positive in her home, you can also send them with siblings. So they would also change their virtual instruction during their cool past that quarantine. So in theory, Mila could come back earlier than, than the siblings. Which is one of the other most confusing parts. Why does the sick person get to come back first? Which is really no longer the case on all that everything has gone to 10. Um, but that, that has been one of the things we had to do that. So I don't know if that answers any questions or maybe just creates more confusion. Um, but we wanted to give you a little bit of idea of kind of how we go about it and why we make the decisions we make. I would say 75 to 80% of the decisions, decisions are made between the three of us and there's conversation between the three of us. Class decisions, anything like that, we always move to it, and I know we moved you guys in when we had to send classes home and had to make a kind of bigger scale, scale of decision. Um, does anybody have questions? Anything you want to explain more than that? I have three daughters, so obviously you know that. If one of them is sick, I should keep all of them home for three So, so that's so the two questions that we get asked a lot. Early on, yes, we were very diligent. If we sent one of them to sick home, one of them to sick home, they all had to go. It didn't necessarily pan out that we ended up with a lot of positive. We still haven't ended up with a lot of positive. And the damage to the kids educationally wasn't worth it. So right now we have not counted on that. And last, we're dealing with a lot of symptoms, or you as a family have a reason to think there's more of it. The other scenario that we don't necessarily always push, push, push is the testing scenario. So if Michael was going to be tested, should he keep his kids home? 
yeah, it'd be great, but it's not that great, and you'll make them. You know, so those are a couple, maybe a little bit more risky things that we haven't lost our mind about, but so far, that, that, that has worked a little bit. But as I said, everybody wants to talk about public figure change tomorrow, and I can have 75 states in and one parent's question, we try to ask some of those questions like, do you know if you've been exposed? Have you been around anyone? You know, anyone else having symptoms? What are the symptoms? We try to ask as many of those questions. If I got anybody who calls me and says they can't take these mouths, I can show them. Yeah, definitely. Everybody goes home with everyone. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah. Doesn't mean they have COVID. That's not right. Fuck. Fuck. We're not taking chances with that. Exactly. Yeah. Especially if it's an adult that calls and tells me they can't take this mouth. It's typically like, yeah, I don't. Other questions? How have the parents overall been, especially in the email I know, because there was a number of classes that had to go out more than once. Are you catching a lot of so I recognize that having a sent home a class um, for quarantine twice, especially very close to each other, is a very sensitive situation. Um, those kind of situations we fall directly to that scenario three where um, we have to respond, but we have to respond, but parents can help change that response by keeping those kids at home. Um, because three days does save time. So um, we're really encouraging parents. We are looking at some of our um, organizational systems at those youngest grades to see if there's ways we can separate them even a little bit more to be to help with some of that. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to respond to our plan to keep kids safe. We made it to week 11, so we ever had a positive student um, in elementary who lived in our building, so what we're doing works. Um, we just need parents' help to make sure that we keep the outside stuff. On the outside, because we're doing great inside our walls. We're just fighting really, really hard to keep it on the outside. The, the biggest struggle my parents have is probably is that that what was 24 days. Like when I start, I had a parent call me today and I said, "We can't have to come back for 24 days." Like, well, it, that's that's a shock to them if they haven't really paid enough attention to how that works. You know that that has been a struggle, but they they get it. Well, it's been 24 days since it's been known. We've had families where someone else has got positive and that quarantine starts over. So we were looking at it could be even more than that because we want the family dynamics on. So it gets real, real tricky. So Especially for some of our families that have generational households with a lot of people in it. And if, you know, one gets sick, three days later someone else gets sick, three days later someone else gets sick, everyone's quarantine keeps restarting. And how are the kids that have been sent home, especially ones that have been sent home multiple times? How are they doing? Are you finding that what they're getting virtually and then coming back? I mean, is everybody pretty much staying where they are? So we use the yeah. we use computers yes. our trimester one for report cards and assessment cycle. Um, and the feedback we received from teachers is that they feel that what's coming back is typical of students who are for working on things at home, like there's some experiences we can't duplicate. But at least they know that the content is being pushed out and parents have access to it. Um, we actually just upgraded our CSOP program today. Um, so if you have a purchase order, then we're going to be giving teachers have more um, space to push out more things to kids at home. Um, and we've made accommodations to families that have reached out now. So really trying to make sure we can accommodate in these situations. And I think the line has really helped on the um for sure. And I've heard that from parents. But it's not the same. I mean, you can't you can't duplicate it, but at least they feel they're not missing a ton of content. They're not coming back a month behind, um, you know. So I think that overall, compared to what we did in March, you know, there's a better a better response. Um, but most of them hate it, and they need to come back as soon as they possibly can. Our last round of virtual parents um, here doing came back incredibly positive that we want permanent virtual. Um, and that's something we're considering going into the, the next part of the year. Here. It's sort of um, uh, surveying some of those parents that are temporary virtual and sort of seeing what students can handle that experience. But our, our core virtual team got incredibly positive. And I would like to compliment the job that you guys are doing because I have heard from parents who have students in neighboring districts who are very frustrated when their kids are sent home on quarantine on the rare occasion that they get to be in a classroom. They said the kids basically go home and do nothing. They are not provided a virtual instruction option while they're in quarantine. and. So there's a lot of frustration um, I'm hearing. So I commend you guys for what you're doing and keeping the kids actively involved even when they are quarantined. Thank you. Thank you. And I do think as much as the stress on the teachers having to catch a kid up that's been out for a month is way more stressful. Way more stressful. Way more stressful. And they would tell you that. Well, thank you. You guys did a great job. Yeah. And, yeah.
all your regular things you do, <laughs> and on top of it is like six more jobs for you and your other educators. And so thank you. Yeah. All right. We have no other updates either. We're just not kept up in here. All right. <laughs> Okay, committee reports. Um, PR is referring to January. We didn't have a December meeting saying with curriculum policy and actually saying with buildings and grounds. So the finance committee met prior to this meeting. Vincy? Finance committee met prior to this meeting. Um, we covered a wide variety of items um, discussing funding, which we just received. We found out four new students this week into the school district. Open enrollment, and um, we are current on all payments, um, include and working on procedures to ensure that our payments will be handled in a timely fashion so that there are not further issues. We um, discussed librarian needs, ELL needs. Um, our budget, we are variants within budget. We're anticipating a surplus. Um, the last item that we did discuss was our line of credit, which unfortunately we did not have. We had resolution, but not proper language, so that will be revisited. Otherwise, um, it was a lengthy meeting, and you were all there. Um, there are no other administrative reports? Okay, thank you. If you got them up. Can we have a motion to approve the consent agenda minus item A? I'll make a motion to consider approval of the consent agenda uh, minus A for book. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Action items. We have one. Um, we need a motion to approve resolution authorizing taxable tax and revenue anticipation promissory note for cash flow purposes that was previously approved by the Board of Education in November as an amount not to exceed two million dollars. Make a motion to approve a resolution authorizing the tax and tax revenue anticipation and promissory note for cash flow purposes that was previously approved by the Board of Education in November as an amount not to exceed two million dollars. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? I think we're gonna do a roll call vote because I think people did further discuss this further and I think that would be appropriate. Um, I mean, I can do it again. Tara. Yes, I. Michael. No. Chad. Well, let's see. I say yes. Jean. Jean Reed, yes. I say. Christiana. Yes. Okay, motion carries. District Administrator Business Manager Report. Uh, the, 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 uh, the COVID was covered uh, really well by these young ladies here. Um, I, I guess the only thing to add is I think the success of being able to stay open is, is uh, made an impact on the opening over the end. And we're not seeing, you know, and, and actually our opening roll out this year was a lot less than forecast. So I think the, the combination of is very positive. And I think if we can stay open, especially with the new, uh, Guidelines in place here, if that would help, uh, that would be a very good thing for us in terms of uh, getting back to the students that we've lost in the last few years. Are the new ones coming in in combination of elementary and middle school high school? I, I, the, 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 I wasn't aware of that one all the well, while, and I think it's really, um, I, I don't know if there were. I just enrolled one the other day. Yeah, okay. But it was a resident, not an OE, now that I know yeah, about it. So it was a resident. It is an OE, so. You know, I had two, two elementary, elementary. Was that resident someone maybe that was homeschooling prior or they were? Um, change of placement for where they live. Yeah. Well, I think ours is a facility there. Yeah, our OE is coming from um, 
So thanks to the work of everyone on our schools. Uh, and that's it. I don't know what uh, I know what the budget reports. Uh, uh, I believe some board members still have to sign off on the budget report that goes to the state. Uh, that has been completed. Uh, yeah, I believe all the work for the final audit report has been completed, and that's also been submitted by our auditors to the state. And I believe that. Um, uh, the, the hard copy of that final audit report probably will come to us sometime in September. And, and we, I'm sure that the uh, will be sharing that with you. And the last item, um, I, I, I think we have a pretty spirited discussion on that in the uh, finance committee. I don't know if there's any other questions or thoughts that we have to that. We did not discuss the Board transit and finance it oh, okay. on the agenda. And it hasn't, it wasn't an action item. So right. it was my understanding that buildings and grounds would have for a fleet assessment before we did anything. Okay. I mean, I believe that is what happened. That they were to do a fleet assessment before yeah, we, we did anything else. Yeah. Uh, so you that, that so, uh, what did you say? I said it meant funds go back to the building and grounds go back to the view. Oh, that's okay. No, I'm, I'm glad you did. I didn't think there was no other. I don't know if there are any further questions on that or any additional discussion at this point. So that's, I uh, believe, all we have for that section. And this, I think during your report, it's appropriate time to introduce Brad. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think so. uh, he started Monday, and uh, he's, he's got a uh, he, Told me he's been sacked and overwhelmed yet, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, I feel like goes on Friday. But uh, at this point, I, I'm really uh, uh, optimistic that I think he's going to fit right in and do a wonderful job, especially in those areas that uh, were an issue tonight in terms of getting things, getting a, a backlog of accounts payable up to date. So um, he's done this work before. Uh, it, it, Brown here school district and also private business. So I think we're in pretty good hands. So I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Welcome aboard, Brandon. Yes. Happy to have you. Thank you. If I may add, he's been doing a great job already in the two days he's been in. Go ahead, Al. What was that, Al? That he's been doing great in the two days that he's been in. <laughs> I I'm impressed. Thank you. Announcements or board comments? I've got, I've got three comments. Um, I'll start by. <clears throat> I want to start by recognizing what you guys are doing for the district and this hot mess that you have to manage. <laughs> um, the fact that you know we're not hearing that you know the world is burning down in our districts is an amazing. Because I, you know, I work on Fifth and Walker, and hear about NPS, and hear about Oak Creek, and hear about Franklin. Again, I know we kind of—I mentioned this last month, but wow, you guys are doing awesome. Thank you. Two, I think that um, we do need a process that if anybody has any concerns within the district, that uh, we have to have that process for people to follow, and that way they feel comfortable that they don't have to go to board members because they're not getting resolution. I think that's very, very important. Okay. Um, I lost my third one somewhere. We're definitely working on that. Any other announcements or comments? I would just like to comment that it echoes what Michael said, but I would like to recognize that our staff, our teaching staff, our aid staff, I have seen aides that have taken on 
someone else's entire job as well as their own to make sure that our children are serviced and educated in a kindly, appropriate manner. And I have seen teachers that have gone or gone prep time so that they could assist the teacher who was teaching remotely because their child was quarantined and taking on that extra workload and giving up their prep time and taking time away from their home and their families and putting in extra hours. I've seen custodians serving food for going lunch and working extra so that our school is clean and a healthy environment. And all of those people as well as you deserve so much more than we can even begin to recognize, but they are going way farther than anyone expects. And I just want to tell them to see them, and I appreciate them. And with just a little step of that, Carrie, if you could convey to Joel, I think the two of you have been, as far as the Trailways Conference goes, working like crazy to keep us in the game, if you want to say. Um, and I do think we, you know, other schools look to us like, hey, can we have our events at your place? And I know you guys were fighting to let the kids come and yeah. watch and be um, spectators. And we not always met with the other schools wanting us what we want to do, but thank you. Yeah. And please thank you all. No, I will keep that for that Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> something. But that's, that's really, I think we look really good. With that too, as well as the, the letter kids still participate. We're going to have band concerts this week, so it'll be a little bit more normal. Thursday, Friday, band concerts. So. Small, small crowds and live stream. Hopefully, all the live stream didn't work in that class. Is that limited to two per student? Two per, two per, per band student. So. Yeah. I have to say, Carrie, I'm really happy about that. That means he doesn't have to sit and suffer through watching. <laughs> so. There is that. There is that. Yeah, and speaking of band, that was wonderful press that we got as far as um, yeah. Mr. Hines and what he's doing. So great. Yeah. Yeah. That was Caitlin. That was off Caitlin. Oh, if I could just add, I had the, I went in trepidatious, but I had the joyful opportunity to sub in our elementary school in the music department. And our music teacher did a fabulous job of recording story that had musical content, lessons, providing video games for the children, even though she was in quarantine, and I can't sing or play, <laughs> but I was able to have those kids in there, and honestly, I don't think they missed a beat in their education musically, so kudos to her. I, I just have one quick question, if I could. Um, I know we just wrapped up first quarter, um, and I know you're working on getting uh, on Hill City. And I was just wondering how you feel overall our students sit academically this first quarter compared to, say, a normal year. Um, I know they <laughs> What's a normal year? What about that? Right, right. Um, you know, I think, I mean, I won't lie that I'm sure that there's some gap. You know, I hear it mostly from my math teachers, if I'm going to be honest. They're the ones that are always talking about, about gap. Uh, but, you know, we are able to utilize our nine hour study hall and utilize our schedule to, to try and get some, get kids some extra help. And, I mean, I honestly haven't heard much complaining that they're behind. I mean, I don't know what Katie would say based on the elementary kids, but, um, you know, I think we're going to have to adjust some things moving forward. But like our AP kids are on track and that's all moving forward as it should be. And, um, you know, we have kids taking forward to work out and they're doing well. So I don't think the gaps are any bigger than anybody else in the world is going to have right now. So. And from our end, we knew that was coming. We can't have like bigger first year, about half a year of construction and expect them to be on level. Um, so we left that down right out of the gate. Um, we knew it really took the lead and set up our uh, first year program to kind of match the match a little bit. Started the year with the end of last year. Um, and sort of did a quick catch up to kind of fill some of those gaps right away. Um, and Kaylee helping sort of frame some really creative ways to your interventionists to coaches and classrooms to try to close as many of them as we can. Um, but our grades when we did them this time. I'll be honest, they, they look like they're about six months behind what we'd like them, but they missed about six months of, of instruction. So 
comparatively, if we were right on par, and we're trying to focus as much as we can. We compare it, when we talk to other districts and how their elementary are doing, and we're right on par. Great. 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 Thank you. Okay, um, upcoming meetings. They're the regular board meetings January 12th. Those will be Browns and Finance will be for that prior to that meeting, and then PR curriculum policy. Do you, we have dates set for those? PR is the 21st of January. Uh, we're the first Tuesday in January. <coughs> okay, then we have a motion to adjourn the closed session. I'll make it a, mo a motion to adjourn the closed session. I'll second. We need a roll call vote for that, so. Tara? Aye. Michael? Aye. Zach? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, we're now in closed session. Okay.